Hi, Misha here, and I tried to do the definitive SKS video this summer, long one, a lot of people have asked, and I thought I really had done it. And then this gun came in. It was actually a local shop, and they said, ah, oh, we got a Russian SKS, typical refurb. No big deal. But, you know, nice, decent. But then I asked them how it was marked. This is an Ishesk SKS. They only made these for two years, 1953-1954. And Tula produced them from 1949 to roughly 1958. And of the roughly 2.7 million SKS 45s built in Russia, we don't know how many Ishes turned out, but it's estimated maybe 150 to 250,000. So less than 1 in 10 is an Ishesk. And they're quite rare. So with that in mind, I thought we would do a video. And I'll be honest with you, I am halfway considering keeping this one because it is a rare factory and I don't actually have one of the classic uh, you know, black paint refurb guns. So the question is, will this get a sling? But first, we're going to talk about the history, kind of focus just in on Russian production, compare this with my early and my late production Tulas, see if there's any you know, manufacturing differences, and then, yeah, we'll see. Is this a keeper or a mover or a long? I'm torn, I'll be honest. But with that, yeah, let's just dive into the history. So, here they are lined up. We have early Tula, Ishesk, and late Tula. And we'll get into some differences in a minute. And I'm not going to go too deep into the history. I've already done a big video for that. But I will say that uh, Sergei Simonov had an up and down career. The ABS 36 looked like a success, but then was quickly retired and replaced for the SVT, but itself wasn't successful. But in the interim, he developed the PTRS-41, which was successful, got him a Stalin Prize. And then eventually, yes, he produced the SKS. He's interesting because he was in, he had a foot in one of each worlds in, in the Soviet arms production. To the old guard, he was the young up-and-comer. He worked under Fedorov, but compared to Kalashnikov, he was well-established. And that's why his rifle has some elements that are very forward-thinking and some elements that are very traditional. 20 and a half inch barrel, fixed underfolding blade bayonet, at least for the most part, short stroke gas piston system, tilting or tipping bolt with reciprocating charging handle on the uh, carrier, semi-pistol grip stock, Fixed 10 round mag, which I said in the previous video was pretty much there because it's what was required. Traditional 1,000 meter rear sight because this was meant to replace the Mosin Nagant, namely the M44, but also some older M9130s. And it was part of the whole series to develop new guns for the new 7.62x39 cartridge, which was probably the most advanced thing about this, the whole intermediate cartridge concept. And uh, even though a handful were trialed out at the end of World War II and it was adopted in 1945, the truth is it wasn't produced outside of trials and pre-production models, test models, until 1949. And production would be starting at the Tula arsenal. While Tula had built some Mosins, by the end of World War II, Mosin production was really left up to Ishesk, and then in 48. Ishesk would tool up to produce the Kalashnikov, with the first Type 1s appearing in 49. Tula, of course, had made the TT-33 Tokra pistol, amongst many others, and so when they started up production of the SKS in 49, it was concurrent and parallel with the AK. Again, to some extent, the SKS was a backup and more conservative design, but also they didn't really know what the AK was yet. They didn't know how useful it would be 
warfare, especially when it comes to vehicles, was changing. So it's not ludicrous this was put into production at all. It was a tried and tested gun. But because the Kalashnikov would have quickly evolved, it did take a few years though. But because it would evolve, it, the SKS would find itself out of production at Tula by 1958. The early guns, in the first few years, between 49 and 51, will see several changes. But after 51, things are pretty stable until we get to 56 when the markings change. Um, the earlier guns are all serialized and then they also have a date and then they have the two of the star on the top. In 56, they quit putting a star on top of the receiver and uh, they put it on the side and they start using a, 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 a code system, a, a letter system, D for 60, uh, 50, excuse me, 56, I for 57, and K for 58. And yes, I know they're not actually Dick, D I K. Uh, this is translating from Cyrillic. I don't know if it has anything to do with it, but I should also just point out coincidentally, 1956 is when other nations started producing the SKS. For example, China and Romania. Kind of makes me wonder if that had anything to do at all with. The change in production or it could just be that earlier guns were nominally meant to go to the soviet red army but by 56 57 they uh, knew that they were pretty much going to export or maybe parades you know because by that time the ak had completely evolved and that gets us to an interesting side story as i said at the beginning Tula made the bulk of SKSs in Russia, but in 1953, sometime around mid-year, Ishes began turning them out, and they were produced through 1954. But that's it. So less than a two-year production run with low six-digit numbers. Again, no one knows for sure. The Russian serial system was intentionally made obtuse to kind of hide numbers and production things. So you can't say they started with, say, AA001 and then worked their way up. No, they, they were, especially the prefixes, were kind of randomly selected. But um, estimates, like I said, are a couple of hundred thousand. It's interesting because HS was really focusing on the AK, but the early versions, the Type 1s, made in 49 and 50, had issues. They had the early press steel stamped receiver. They would switch to the Type 2 AK, which had a machined receiver, but it really wasn't all the way there. Kind of makes me wonder if this is why they started up SKS production as a side note at Ishesk. But in 53, we get the definitive milled AK, the Type 3. Between 53 and 50, 54 is when the Type 3 would phase in. There were transitional models. And it seems like once the Type 3 milled AK came, it just stopped making the SKS. Coincidentally, Tula, who never made the milled AK, AK-47, would make the AKM. They would switch over in the early 60s. The AKM was officially adopted in 1959, and as you recall, they stopped making SKSs in 58. So they dropped the SKS when the stamped AKM came along, and uh, you'll start to see Tula examples in 60 in the early 60s. And these are the first Tula Kalashnikovs. It's this point they really know what it is, and the new AKM model is just faster and easier to produce. But that's not to say the SKS is. Uh, is a bad machine. Far from it. It's just old world World War II technology which is getting less and less cost effective to make with 1960s production standards. So this is pretty standard controls. You've got a thumb safety and of course reciprocating bolt handle. Fixed magazine. It does hold open. Empty. And of course it's topped off by 10 round curved chargers. I'm not going to insert this because SKSs have a weird habit because of the free floating firing pin and uh, not going to risk it. I just want to show you a clip. Of course, you just insert it. 
press it in. There you go. It's a lot of fun. It really is. Of course, some aftermarket guns do have detachable mags to get it to let go empty, press it down, and release it. Pretty standard positions here to disassemble with the short stroke piston, and of course, finally, the bayonet. And of course, this being a refurb, it has the more dull finish bayonet. Fun fact, the cleaning rod is very, very similar to an AK, but the head is different. Let me get it out here. Okay, it's been a dick. Oh well. But the head's actually smaller to let this fold and lock on versus an AK. If you put an AK cleaning rod in one, it'll be fine here, but when you go to put your bayonet out, it won't quite, uh, won't quite go all the way. I guess I should say that an AK cleaning rod is similar to an SKS because this came first, right? But no, really uh, interesting guns. And of course, you've got your trap door in the butt for the standard cleaning kit, which is quite different from an AK kit. Even though the SKS-45 did not change much in production when it comes to the big things, you know, magazine, barrel, overall function, quality, but there are still several changes on the small parts, especially in the early, early days. The very first versions actually had a cruciform, a spike bayonet, somewhat inspired by the uh, M44s, but it was an underfolding and it was blued. And the barrel was non-chromed. And interestingly, it had a spring-loaded firing pin and it had a hardwood stock made out of arctic birch. But in 1950, things started to change. In fact, we have two years of transition. Early on, the blued spike bayonet would be replaced by a blued blade bayonet. And then, in 1951, the barrel would get a chrome line bore. And it may be just be a coincidence, but it, around the exact same time, the blued bayonet went to a plated, silver, almost chromed type. Kind of makes me wonder if the two are connected somehow. But yeah, in 51, you'll see the blade go from blued to silver. But not to be confused with the refurbished silver, which is kind of a dull silver versus the gloss. These glossy ones can sometimes look gold. That's actually just age in kind of grease. And just it just aged the material. But originally they were just silver. And of course, as we know, and somewhat to our regret, the firing pin went from spring loaded to um, to floating around 1950, 51 as well. No one knows for sure exactly why, but a couple of theories have been floated around. My early gun still has its spring loaded firing pin, so why'd they drop it? few theories, and maybe all are true, certainly all seem plausible. The reason people don't like free floating is the danger of slam fires or other kind of accidents. But Russian guns have had free floating firing pins for a long time. The Makarov, the AK, so on and so forth. What we know for sure is going away from the spring certainly saved parts and time making it. It also meant you could have a fatter, thicker firing pin because you don't have the space for the spring there, so this more durable. And while a spring prevents the pin from getting stuck in the forward position, this, you know, slam fires, if the spring itself gets screwed up, it can actually stick the firing pin in the rear position. For example, maybe you've got a lot of mud, ice, or even just super cold, it can freeze it up, or Maybe the spring itself gets mangled and quits doing springy things and does jagged pieces of metal things. This could happen for any number of reasons, just wear and tear, bad metallurgy, or say a ruptured primer could blow back into the firing pin ch channel and mangle it up. So who knows, it could have just been a simply a cost thing too. But it, by 51 it was dropped and really wouldn't reappear for the SKS until Americans started throwing them in their guns in the 1990s. Regardless of the firing pin, we'll see other changes, especially early on again. The trigger guard changes the way it's machined, getting this step put in it. 
here. Notice that the ish has, has the same step. The safety would get a better detent to lock in either position. And uh, the rear sights lightning cut style would actually change it up a bit from more of a narrow on the other side to a fatter one a little bit on the underside. The gas block actually changes several times. This is a pretty early style and there's actually one in between that and these two. But those are the major ones. The bayonet ring gets lightning cuts here on each side. And we do start to see laminate stocks appear. Some guns mid to late production would leave the factory with laminated arctic birch stocks, but usually when you run across them, they're on factory refurb guns like this one here. And I should also point out that the box with the slash through it is actually a depot inspecting mark. It usually means that you'll have a replacement gun, but you can have guns that had very minor work done to them that have the box and the slash. And you can even have them that were untouched, that just meant they went through the depot, they were in good enough shape, nothing needed change, and they just got the box stamp to show that they were accepted. So that's what it means is basically this gun's good to go. And we most commonly see it with refurbished guns like uh, this one here. You can see the difference. The bluing on early guns is quite nice and even late guns like this one, quite good. You have a bolt, very shiny early on. And even later it stays quite shiny. But when you go to refurb, you get this. And you get this black paint. I think it is, they, they call it bluing. It kind of reminds me of stuff that you would find on a um, old gate or fence. I will give a credit though, even though it's not attractive. It was cheap and easy to apply and pretty good at preventing rust. Same goes for the shellac. These uh, Russian SKS has usually had a reddish shellac on the stocks, but refurbs are known to have a sloppier coating than original. Same goes for the sling swivels, butt plate. The paint can get really messy there. And like we already talked about, the blade, much like the bolt carrier, has a dull appearance during refurbishment. However, all that said, it's not as if refurbishment was done by an importer or a third party. That was done by the U.S. <laughs> the, there we go. The, uh, the Russian, the Soviet government. So it's an official proper configuration and a lot of Russian refurb guns were given or sold as war aid to friendly communist nations around the world. So you, you can find reef gun, refurb looking guns like this all over. Uh, Russia exported the SKS very widely from the mid 50s onward. Egypt was a big user. Places in Africa, elsewhere, in South America, of course, East Asia, Hungary, Bulgaria, Czechoslovakia got some. Poland got some. Some nations, of course, had their own production. Not that many, though, because most nations like Poland saw this as an antiquated technology. And while they would be willing to take some from Russia, they didn't want to pay money. <laughs> so, yeah. But that's more for the other video. We'll flip them over to keep looking at differences. A few to talk about on this side. I will say that the magazine latch on the early guns has very large, coarse serrations. By 52, 53, they go to more finer serrations. Same here, and this one's bigger. The rear takedown latch changes. This has a big lip. This is much smaller on the Ishesk and the later Tula. Note the dimple that's meant for a bullet tip. Actually, quite a smart idea so a pin can't get lost in the field. And the latch for the gas tube changes too. The early style here with the small lip on the other side gives way. Here's the Ishesk. And here's the late production, 
that actually loses the lip and moves the bullet tip back. I guess that makes sense. This would be less likely to catch compared to the transitional or the early style. So yeah, and again, difference in the bolt carrier finishes. I don't hate refurbished guns. They, they just simply are what they are. So they made these in 53 and 54. 53s are the rarer of the two years. This one's a 54, so it's not the rarest of the rare, but you know, still less common. And these just kind of came in mixed in with uh, the Ishesk guns. Well, at least until a bilateral agreement between the US and Russia that blocked a lot of importation of Russian guns in the mid 90s. Mm -hmm. But for a time, these were coming over and Russian SKSs were everywhere and affordable. And even after they were blocked in the US, for years they flowed into Canada. Seems like up there, Ishes guns are more common than they've ever been down here. But uh, regardless, neat gun. So to answer the question, when it comes to features or the way they were built, is there really a difference between a Tula and an Ishesk? And let's just go ahead and discount earlier versions made before 1952. And the answer is really no. Um, the late Tula here and the Ishesk pretty much have identical features. A few small differences like the takedown latch here. But then again, that kind of shares with the earlier Tula. And if you were to get a Tula from 54, it'll look the same. And of course, you also have to discount anything done during refurbishment, like the stock or the uh, the finish. So the only real difference, yeah, it's, it's the markings. Because I have had in the past a non-refurbished Ishesk, and it you know, had the relatively good deep blowing and the silver parts. Still makes it cool, though, because this came out of the same factory as the AK. And... Um, has the pretty famous triangle but no the the russians were remarkably consistent with production especially after the first couple of years and that carries over to sks's from either factory although if you look at sks production from other places in the world obviously china then you start to see some very interesting variations but we're just focusing on Soviet Russia in this video. And here's the good old-fashioned import mark. It is on the receiver, but smaller and more neatly done than we see in more recent eras. A lot of these guns were imported by KBI, which was what Kastner became after the 1989 ban. But uh, this one's not, interestingly. But it still has the CCCP serial number prefix, which uh, a lot of them did for import. Uh, the ATF doesn't allow um, non-essentially English characters, you know, no non-Latin uh, characters. So Cyrillic, you can't put into a bound book. So they have to do something there or just ignore them altogether. But good old-fashioned import marks. Well, I've already talked about the dreaded import mark, especially the evil CCP one. I, I don't think people really care so much today, but in the 90s that was the, the mark of Cain for these guns. But anyway, let's let's talk about importation into the USA because before these evil marks, the SKS, especially Russians, were very rare here. Going back to the 70s, the only ones in America were bringbacks, at least for the most part. In the 80s, China started selling some of their surplus guns here, as well as some newly assembled ones. And then the Russian guns joined in 1992, so very soon after the end of communism there. And these would all be surplus. Russia didn't start up production. They, they've been out of it for a long time. And uh, as I've already kind of alluded to, the couple of big names in importation were KBI, Mike Kastner's company, and Century Arms, which would have been in uh, St. Albans at that time. They didn't move to their new location until uh, I don't know, 2021, 2022. So all the Russian guns would have come in through the older address and then they came in until 1996 because as i said the us and russia signed an agreement a treaty a trade thing and that blocked these from coming in it's really remarkable how many russian skss are here considering 
you know, four years or less. But they brought over lots, and of course they were already they were already made. They were already in warehouses. They didn't have to build them up. At the very most, they had to make boxes for them. And they came in these wonderfully what I call communist cardboard boxes with a hammer and sickle on them. It's kind of funny, but they, the presentation was neat, and they were inexpensive, around a hundred bucks at the time. And you just, you know, a lot of them were the refurb style, but there were different ones that crept in, even a few odd ones, like a handful of spikers, other ishesks and things, but that's gone. And even though KBI and Century brought over the lion's share, as I pointed out, this one's actually imported by CDI. This seems to stand for Classic Distributing, Classic Distributors. What's interesting, very similar name to Century Arms, CAI, CDI, and it's also in Vermont, which is not a very big state. Hmm. But they brought over some. Another company way over in California was NHM. They brought over some. And one I didn't even know about till relatively recently, Springfield Armory brought over a batch of Russian SKSs. I, I found that funny. I, I, I did not know. But then again, Mossberg imported Galil receivers once, so strange things happen. But uh, yeah, those were the major importers in the 90s. They got shut down, and of course, other guns would come in. A few years later, the Yugos would flood the market, and uh, Chinese guns had been banned in 94. But then they started to come in in the 21st century because of the CNR rule. They'd been in third-party countries long enough. They were no longer quote-unquote Chinese. And so you started to see some Chinese SKSs coming in in the uh, early to mid-2010s. And with them, we actually got some more Russians by accident. Around 2013-2014, not one, but two different importers, IO and TGI, Tennessee Gun, brought over some... Chinese slash Albanian origin SKSs, and since Russia had been moving their own SKSs around the world so much, a lot of Russian guns came in with them. I mean, proportionally it was small, but still they made it over. Kind of like the um, Russian Makarovs. We did a recent video on Russian Makarovs, and some of them snuck in with Bulgarian. The importers got in trouble for this because the paperwork wasn't properly filled out, but luckily... They didn't recall them from owners. Now, I've heard that distributors sometimes send them back to the importers to get a refund. But if you owned a sneaky gun, I've never heard of the ATF coming down on anyone if you bought it legitimately. But technically, yeah. So there was a small accidental batch about a decade ago. IO still in business. Tennessee gun? Uh, no. They, they got in other trouble and no longer here. The agreement from the 90s with Russia is still in place and of course that's not even getting into the current political trade situation with Russia and America so my point is I doubt more will be coming in but like I said our misfortune was kind of Canada's fortune a lot of the guns that probably would have come here or gone to Australia when they banned them there they ended up going to Canada because it was one of the few places left they could take a gun as evil as this and ending back out here. Actually, quite a nice afternoon. Um, because the weathermen are always so accurate, it was supposed to be cloudy and stormy all day. And it is not. So we've talked about it, the history. At the end of the day, does it get a sling? Yeah, I think so. As I said earlier, these haven't come in in many years, probably never will again directly from Russia. It's a good example. I'm not in it a ton of money. Something to stick back. So I think for now, yeah, put a sling on it. Yes, this is a Russian sling. Yes, it's also an RPK Russian sling. I just, I grabbed this out of the box just looking for a standard SKS AK sling and then I was about to put this back and I thought, you know, being out here, it's easier to clip it on the back than having to thread it all. So I was being lazy. It is Russian. But yeah, the, the double hook is actually, you see these a lot in the Afghan war on AKs and RPKs. SKSs are charming and I'm really glad they're getting kind of the love and attention they've always deserved. A lot of times in the past, especially in the 90s, they were just seen as budget discount AKs. 
It's not correct. This is a World War II era self-loading rifle, one of the very first originally completely designed for an intermediate cartridge. Yeah, pretty unique. And I like the history with Simonov and going all the way back to his APS-36. But again, if you really want to get into a deep dive, look at all the foreign versions. I did a three-hour video in the middle of a thunderstorm back in July, so check that out. But just kind of wanted to zero in on the Russian production, compare and kind of decide for myself, is this worth hanging on to or not? But yeah, I think it is. Appreciate you helping me figure it out, guys. You're a lot of help. But no, if you uh, own SKSs, uh, feel free to chat below. I really enjoy the collecting community surrounding them. It's kind of low-key, fun, what have you. And of course, you can still shoot these. The cartridge is everywhere. It shoots your standard 760 by 39 available at, at any fine mom-and-pop store in America. But with that, appreciate you hanging out. If you could, please do like, share, and subscribe. And if you'd like to help out, check out the link to Patreon. This is Misha. Catch you very soon next time.